Hello, and thank you for tuning in to this talk about the Queen's College Translation Exchange. I'm Charlotte Ryland, and I founded the exchange just under three years ago now. The exchange is an outreach initiative that uses translation to get people of all ages engaging in language learning and international literary culture. We've engaged thousands of people of all ages over the past year in particular, and I'm going to share some of those successes with you today. Um, in particular, I'm going to be talking about our work with young people. First of all, I want to say a little bit about how I came to set up the exchange and why I'm so convinced that translation is the key to motivating language learners of all ages, and above all, the key to an inclusive form of outreach. So I started out as a Germanist, um, and it was while I was a lecturer in German at Queen's College that I um, became particularly aware of and concerned by the decline in language learning that was happening at school level in particular. This is especially acute for German, as many of you will know, but it's, but it's the case across the board that numbers have really plummeted in recent years. Um, and so alongside my lecturing, um, I started to get involved in as many outreach activities as I could. Um, and this culminated in my working with Professor Catherine Cole um, of the Modern Languages faculty here um, and Jesus College to set up something called the Oxford German Network. Um, which is uh, an initiative to promote German, in particular, uh, to young people. Um, and we uh, set up a national competition called the Oxford German Olympiad that has um, huge numbers of entrants every year from across the country. Um, at the same time as um, doing these things, I was running a project beyond the university called New Books in German. New Books in German is uh, an international project that promotes German language literature in particular to publishers in the UK and the US. Um, and as part of that role, I was working, as you can imagine, with lots of literary translators um, and with publishers. And what I found um, while I was working was it, it, for, for NBG was how exciting uh, the world of international literature was. Um, and while I was at NBG for the 10 years that I was there, there really was an explosion in terms of sort of numbers of books being translated and events and initiatives um, and I became really aware of how uh, collaborative and how exciting that world is and so it seems strange to me that there was this disconnect between what was happening in the world of international literature and what was happening in language learning at schools um, and I want to, I started to think about ways that those two those two things could be brought together while I was at New Books in German, um, I ran lots of translation workshops, in particular with emerging translators. Um, and I really started to see the power of the translation workshop, um, the light that goes on in people's eyes when they have the opportunity to work together on a text um, and to, to really think about how to transform it across languages and across cultures. So it started to seem to me that translation workshops were the perfect vehicle for languages outreach. Um, and this is because they give participants an enriching and exciting experience in the moment. They show you how exciting it is to be a linguist rather than telling you how exciting it is to be a linguist. And as you'll see, this is really at the core of everything that we do at the Translation Exchange. But this relates to a metaphor um, that you often see in this small but growing world of uh, translation and education. Translation being a Trojan horse. So what we know is that people really enjoy translation. They really enjoy translating together. When you translate, you're reading very carefully. You're also writing creatively. But at the same time, there are lots of other things happening. So there's the cre creativity, the collaboration that I've already talked about. Language awareness is key. Um, you have to engage with the grammar, with the vocabulary, um, with the mechanics of the language in order to be able to translate effectively. It's a very confidence building activity because it's such a sort of gradual process, um, as you will see. And it's a great way of making authentic texts accessible. So it was really clear, um, the more I learned about translation and saw translation in action in this way, it was really clear that there was something really special happening um, and that it was something that could be put to good use for the languages outreach that I really wanted to do. Um, and it is out of this realization that the Translation Exchange was born. So I joined together with uh, colleagues, modern languages colleagues at Queen's to establish the Translation Exchange in 2018. 
Queen's is a great modern languages college um, and it's also has a really strong translation tradition. This is most prominently because it's home to modern poetry and translation. Um, Queen's gave um, some funding to, to um, start the project and continues to fund us. Um, and we're now generously supported by an old member of Queen's as well. The principle of the exchange from the outset was that it would be open to all and that it would reach out to as much as possible beyond the walls of the university. So um, we've had partnerships with bookshops, with third sector organizations, with Oxfordshire libraries, for example. And after about a year, we really started to see the effect of this. People were coming to our events who'd never been to a university event before, despite living in the city, um, in some cases for decades. And the numbers attending our events shot up as a result, as well as the sort of lively atmosphere at those events. Then the pandemic hit and suddenly our audience wasn't just pe people able to attend events in central Oxford, but theoretically the whole world. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about the effect that this has had on our programming and on our impact. So right from the outset, when I started thinking about setting up the translation exchange, um, I was sure that the main thing that I wanted to do was to get undergraduates and postgraduates into classrooms running translation workshops. Um, and this is um, a scheme that's now known as our Creative Translation Ambassadors Scheme, um, and it remains at the heart of the project. Um, so, and this goes back to the conviction um, that I've always already talked about, about what good outreach is. And to me, good outreach and effective outreach is outreach that has content at its core. Um, so it's about showing people's how exciting it is to be a linguist rather than telling them that it's exciting or telling them that it will get them a better job when they're older or enable them to travel in future years. It's about having a really exciting experience in the here or now. It's about showing them that you don't have to be fluent or a walking dictionary in order to be able to access culture in other languages and, and for those cultures to really enrich your life. In fact, you don't even need to leave your school or as we've all learned in the past year, you don't have to leave your home in order to have those sorts of enriching intercultural experiences. So what you can see in the picture on your screen is two of our undergraduate ambassadors um, giving a workshop to a class of primary school children in Cowley in Oxford. This was a couple of years ago, pre-pandemic, of course. Um, and I particularly like this photo because we have here on the screen um, this question, does anyone here know more than one language? Um, and this reflects a key aspect of um, creative translation. And one of the things I really love about it, um, which is its ability to bring in more languages than the mainstream um, languages that are usually taught in the classroom. Um, and you can see so many hands up here in answer to this question. In fact, it was well over 50% of the pupils in this class that um, spoke what's sometimes referred to as a home language or a community language. Um, but there isn't always space for those languages to come into the classroom. And what is really central to everything that we do is that, um, that there is a kind of leveling, that there's a breaking down of language hierarchies. So there's always a moment in these workshops where the, the young people are encouraged to, um, to talk about their the other language skills that they have and to share those with their peers. So um, in order to set up this scheme, we coordinated with two um, third sector organizations, the charity, the Stephen Spender Trust and um, the organization Shadow Heroes. So the Stephen Spender Trust pioneered creative translation work in schools. Um, it's been running programs for over 10 years now and that with a particular focus on training professional translators to run workshops in schools. Um, at about the same time as I set up the translation exchange, I also became director of the Stephen Spender Trust. And so that partnership has been um, a particularly fruitful one. And now many of the programmes that we run are partnerships with the Stephen Spender Trust. Of course, nobody's been able to actually go into any schools to run workshops for over a year now. Um, and so this has uh, caused us to develop 
virtual ways of doing this uh, this outreach activity and of getting the undergraduates and the postgraduates into into schools. So the training program is is still very similar to how how we set it up three years ago. Um, we train the students to design and deliver translation workshops, but we also now train them to turn them to turn those workshops into virtual resources that can be delivered by the teachers. And what you can see on your screen here is um, a Padlet, which is a particularly useful platform that's used by a lot of teachers. Um, and it's a really great way of presenting multimedia formats. So you've got videos here, you've got um, worksheets, you've got PowerPoints, um, and this all together uh, comprises one workshop, which a teacher then um, presents to the, to the students. And we've made videos absolutely central to all of this so that there's, even though the students can't be present in person, they are at least present um, on video and able to speak directly to the young people. So as I say, we're now in the third year of this ambassadors project. And um, while we've had great feedback from the teachers and the pupils that we've been able to work with, we started to think quite early on about how we could make this even more impactful how we could make it more sustainable and make it reach um, more young people across the country. Um, and that is how uh, our latest major project um, was born, which is the Anthea Bell Prize for Young Translators. So this prize is named after the great translator Anthea Bell. She's best known for her translations of Asterix, um, but uh, she also translated a huge number of um, outstanding German novels and I had the pleasure of working with her in my time at New Books in German. She's she was really committed during her lifetime to encouraging young people to learn languages um, and also to emerging translators joining the profession. So it seemed really, really fitting that, uh, that her name would be put to this, to this new prize. The basic idea of the prize is that we um, produce resources, which are kind of mini translation workshops that teachers can uh, deliver to their pupils. Um, and these at the moment are in four languages, French, German, Mandarin, and Spanish. Um, and we've developed resources about translating poetry, fiction, and nonfiction. And then at the end of the school year, um, so coming up for the first time this year, there is a competition for selected schools um, and an awards event. So I wanted to show you an example of one of the resources. Um, this is a, po a French poetry resource, um, which is aimed at level one um, in, our, in our scheme, which is basically um, those who've just started learning French, uh, mostly 11 year olds in, um, in English schools. So as you can see, um, this resource resolves around poems by the renowned French poet Guillaume Apollinaire. Um, and uh, it focuses on his image poems or calligram, calligrams. Um, and so you can see here, it's a really visual way of introducing the language. I'll leave you to guess what's being uh, represented here. And it's a sort of stage process using literal translation to get the students engaging with the text and then making their own texts. In every resource, um, you'll find this slide, which takes the teachers and the pupils through the three stages of a creative translation. And this is based on, on recent work by the Stevens Bender Trust, sort of really thinking about distilling what happens when you translate. Um, so we have decode, then translate, and then create. Decoding then is about understanding. We use glossaries. We even use Google Translate um, if necessary in order to um, figure out what's going on in the text and to make it really accessible. We then translate, and that's a literal translation. So then you end up with something really clunky. Um, at that point, you might rip up your glossary um, or throw away uh, your uh, dictionary. And, um, and, and then move on to the creative phase. Now this can be um, as simple as turning that clunky translation into something um, that is a bit more polished and that works well in English, 
or you can be even more creative and you can, for example, uh, reproduce a poem, reproduce the poem um, in a new century or in a new continent, or you could write a new piece of prose um, that uses similar themes to the original piece of prose. There are all sorts of options there and it's a, um, it's a real, really great springboard for creative writing. And here you can see that creativity in action. So um, along with some feedback that I'll, that I'll share with you in a moment, um, teachers have been sending us the work that their pupils have been producing in class. Um, and we've just been absolutely um, awed by what's been happening. Um, so on the top, in the top right, you can see um, what one class um, produced after one of our resources, which is all about Chinese idioms. And this was again was be beginner Mandarin um, learners. Um, and and the, the sort of looking at the resource looks in particular, the sort of poetic aspects of those of those idioms, the lyrical aspects of those idioms. And then round the edge, um, we have the follow up to the Apollinaire resources that I showed you. Um, and this is um, translating a, a, a poem about the moon and a mouse and some cheese. And you can really see here how uh, the children have have run with this with this idea. And I think one of the one of the really important things that this shows as well is how translation um, very easily becomes cross curricular. So here you've got the pupils who may not think of themselves as particularly good linguists, but love drawing. Um, and they're able to bring that drawing skill into their language learning. So that's the feedback, as it were, from the young people. And then we've also been gathering feedback um, from teachers. And I've just picked out three quotations here that I really like because I think they cover some of the range of what's, um, of what's happening when you translate with young people. Um, and I've just picked out in green some of the, the key words here. Um, helping the students to understand why they are studying languages, um, thinking about language as a real skill that's useful in the real world. Um, it's inspiring, there's contemporary relevance, there's space for creativity. Um, in that final quotation, there's that word challenge, but it's a really positive, enriching challenge, clearly. And then finally, finishing with that very pleasing phrase for us, a joy to teach. Now, one of the Things that's going on with modern languages teaching at the moment um, in in schools is that is that there is um, a a crisis around recruitment and, and retainment of teachers, um, and so the opportunity for teachers to remember why they became linguists in the first place, to really um, enjoy and sort of relish their um, uh, the experience of working with language and remind them of their love of languages. That's absolutely key to. Um, the rewarding to, to kind of retaining a rewarding experience of teaching. And of course that enjoyment is then transmitted to the students. So the final thing I wanted to say about the Anthea Bell Prize um, is how we've started to bring this together with the ambassadors program that I mentioned earlier on. And you see on your screen, um, three videos that have been made by undergraduates. The first two on the left um, are by undergraduates talking about translation, how they use it in their studies, why they enjoy learning languages so much, why they enjoy reading um, literature and other languages. And that forms part of an introductory video that we made to, for the prize, which all pupils taking part in the prize see. Um, and I was particularly pleased when I um, grabbed this screenshot uh, for this presentation to see that there were 1, 000, over 1,600 views of this um, unlisted video, which means um, that teachers have shown this to their pupils around 1,600 times. And this reflects the numbers that we've had registering for the prize. So we've had over 450 teachers registering, mostly from state schools. Um, and um, as you've seen, the, the sort of feedback that they've been giving us. Then on the right here, um, we have uh, undergraduates Dalvin and Josh, who made a video for us about one of the passages in um, one of the resources. So this is a Spanish uh, piece of Spanish prose. And here they're, they're talking to each other about you know, how they would approach the passage as translators, what they think the interesting and challenging aspects of it are. Um, and so all of these are really great ways of bringing these undergraduates um, into classrooms. And we've also had great um, responses from teachers um, thanking us for, for um, giving this, this kind of 
content. So those are some of our activities for young people. I wanted to spend the last few minutes just highlighting our other programs, um, which are available um, and, and open to everybody wherever you are in the world. Um, in practice, these are open to young people too. And we've been really pleased that um, six formers in particular have been joining in our book club and in our translation workshops. Um, I think it's really important that young language learners feel part of a community and that, that they can kind of see ahead and see what it means to be a linguist, not necessarily to use languages every day um, in, your, in your working um, or personal life, but just to what it means to have another language or other languages. Um, and so it's great that the young people who've been taking part in things like our international book club. Having said that, we also feel it's important that um, there are some activities that are uh, dedicated just for the young people. So for example, our international book club now has a, uh, a schools version um, where uh, young people aged roughly 15 to 18 come together on Zoom to talk about a book in translation that they've read. And that's exactly what happens with our um, main book club, which is open to everybody of all ages. Um, these started in person and we occasionally um, were able to invite the translators to join us. Since they've been happening on Zoom, we've always had the translator there. Um, and you can see on your screen here, some of the um, books and translators that we've uh, featured over the past, the past year or so. Uh, we have a combination of, of Q and A with the translator and then, and then uh, discussion in breakout rooms and then a plenary discussion at the end so that everybody has the opportunity to talk about the book. Um, Related to this, the book club that we've been running for um, schools is this brand new project um, called Reviewing the World or Reviewing the World, um, which is an opportunity for young people to read a, a, a work in translation and then to write a review, which we will then publish on our website. Um, so it's aimed in particular at young language learners. It's about giving them the opportunity to read beyond their curriculum to have an insight into this wonderful world of, of literary translation. Um, all of the books that we're recommending are um, high profile in some way, they've won a prize, um, they're, they're translated by an award-winning translator. Um, and so uh, it gives those young people the opportunity to, to find out about those books and then perhaps to have their very first publication of, of a book review. We also run a an annual residency for an international writer and translator. Um, you can see here some of our, the residents um, in the past couple of years. First, Erin Moore and Chus Pato for our Galician residency. And you can see there um, them reading there at um, Queens with Abathid. Then um, Galina Rumbu and Helena Kernan took part in our Russian language residency last year. And coming up, we have um, our first virtual residency. Um, which features the translator from Korean, Anton He, and the Korean author, Bora Chung. And that's taking place um, during May, and the information about that will be available on our website shortly. Um, we found that there were so, there is so many interesting things going on with Korean literature at the moment that we've um, turned the residency into a Korean season. Um, and that started a few weeks ago with a translation workshop um, run by Mato Mandaslut, um, translator from Korean, and he worked on um, a on translations by the poet uh, Che yong um, who sadly died in January of this year. Mato has been working with her for a number of years. Um, he talked about her work and then led the participants through this collaborative translation. I wanted to talk about this um, today because it really um, it was a really impressive example of how collaborative virtual translation can work. So there were roughly 40 people all over the world, all in different time zones. Um, and we used Google Docs and Zoom chat to work together to translate this, uh, this poem. It was really thrilling to watch the Zoom chat filling up with um, ideas and, and phrases and people sort of bouncing off each other. And it really showed what's possible even if you're not in the same room. It, it reminded me that translation is all about collaboration and creativity, as I've already said, um, but it's also about respect and listening. And that reminded me of um, a 
translation workshop that I observed a few years ago with a year five class. So kind of age nine, 10, they were all working together to translate um, a Polish picture book. And afterwards we interviewed some of the pupils um, and one of them, when we asked her what she'd sort of needed in order to be able to do this translation work well with her classmates, she said, I needed to listen. That was her sort of first response. I needed to listen to my classmates. Um, and that just really struck me as, as, as something so important about this work that it's really about, it's about sharing and it's about listening as much as it is about producing and creating. Um, I think the other sort of side note to that is that um, this girl was, it turned out that she spoke Punjabi at home and it took a while of our, of our interviewing her before this came out. She'd already talked about um, knowing English and Spanish because she was learning a bit of Spanish at school. Um, but she, hadn't, she clearly hadn't really thought about Punjabi on the same level as those other languages. And we, by talking to her, we were able to um, make her see that she was already a translator, that she already had these amazing language skills and that she could bring them um, to bear on her, her education as well. Okay, the last thing I wanted to um, share is very relevant to these, um, these ideas around collaborative virtual translation. So last spring, when we realized that we wouldn't be able to um, run any of the in-person activities that we'd planned, um, we set up this new project, translating a blog that was being published in Le Monde at the time. Um, and it's, it's a comics blog by the author and artist Fiamma Lipsati, who's an Italian French author. She gave us permission to, um, to, to translate these blogs into English, which were being serialized in, the, in Le Monde at the time. And we had 122 people all across the world working collaboratively on this project, working in small groups, taking one episode of the blog each. They corresponded by Zoom, by email, by WhatsApp, um, and we also had then bigger sharing sessions. So you can see down here on the left, um, some bigger sharing sessions where people came together and shared challenges and ideas and, and helped each other to, to move the project on. And so after several months um, of this collaborative virtual work, we were then able to publish a series of the blogs in English um, on our website. And you'll be able to see those if you, if you go to our web pages. So that is a whistle stop tour of our work at the Translation Exchange. Thank you for listening. Hopefully it's been clear um, uh, how you can get involved if you would like to. I've listed a few um, possibilities here, taking part in our workshops, our book club, coming to residency events and spreading the word to teachers and young people about our uh, schools programmes. There are various ways that you can keep in touch with what we're doing. Um, we have web pages on the Queen's website. This is my email address. We're very active on social media. Um, and we also have a mailing list um, where we promise not to bombard you with information, but we send occasional newsletters that um, contain information about all of our upcoming events. I've talked a lot about collaboration today. And while that's very important for creative translation, um, it's also absolutely key to our work at the exchange. We're a very small but growing team of undergraduates, postgraduates and academics. And you can see who we are um, by visiting our web pages and looking at the uh, team pages on there. And finally, a reminder that you can sign up to the MML newsletter, the Oxford Polyglot. Thank you very much for listening. <laughs>